use that to, to grow. Um, uh, with, with the blessings of Eric, uh, I've, I've gotten the opportunity to have four acres of papaya, um, and I've been learning a lot. Um, we're growing uh, four acres of papaya um, without uh, any chemical synthetic fertilizers or any herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, any sides at all. Um, and actually, almost 100% from the state. Um, I do have to use a little bit of imported potassium because potassium is a really hard one to find out here in any sort of pure form. You find little bits of it here and there, but uh, other than potassium, it's been uh, almost 100%. Oh, I used a little bit of neem too uh, that wasn't from here. Other than that, almost 100%. And then I think that's kind of why I'm here today. I, I sent this picture to Drake, um, just like, oh, hey, you know, isn't that kind of cool? Um, and he posted it somewhere else. And, and then I saw Tanya. I saw Tanya down, <coughs> um, downtown, and she's like, Oh my God! I saw the picture, and how'd you do that? And um, and so I uh, I uh, I got asked to come here and to kind of explain this. So this is a an IMO five kind of IMO four or five somewhere in there um, four and a half we'll call it. That's 100% uh, local, 100% uh, locally sourced. Um, I really really liked the uh, IMO the IMO way of, of composting, um, the the Korean way of composting. I, I've done. I've been a big fan of composting. Um, compost mulch is just a fantastic way to go. And the Korean natural farming was just so far advanced in their understanding of composting um, that I, I've uh, just really taken to it. So this was some dirt that uh, a friend gave me from Javi. I live down in, down in Kapoho, and we don't really have much soil there to begin with. So um, whenever I get a chance, I bring in good stuff. So this is from Javi. Really good soil, but it was choked full of weeds that I didn't want, including one aku grass, which I do not want in my house. Don't have it, don't want it. Um, so, you know, I found composting as a, a nice way to cook, to, to, to kind of cook off the weeds and um, to, to, to turn dirt into soil. You know, lots of times you, you get fresh dirt and it's, um, it's just dirt, you know, it's, it's, it's powdery and it's clods and it's, you know, it doesn't have great structure. So, um, so I've been making kind of IMO four and a half, five uh, piles with it that just totally transform it. Uh, I use that with the papayas that we're doing. Uh, I'll get to that later. Um, so this pile right here, the uh, the basic recipe has been somewhat transforming. Um, each pile, I'm I'm trying to fine tune it and figure out, okay, what is the recipe? I'm still still figuring that out right now. But the basics, um, as far as I found, are Dirt, of course, start with dirt. 10 to 20% organic matter. Okay, I use that term loosely, I just call it organic matter because, you know, we don't, um, y y you just kind of got to go with what's, what's around. I mean, some people have wood chips really easily accessible. Uh, some people have green waste. Some people have sawdust. Some people have grass clippings. So um, I think almost all of those 10% biochar, 2 to 5% of the fish meal. And the fish meal again has been amended with the potassium other elements. Um, and then the the way in which you blend those, you can just kind of take all of the components and throw them in a pile. But I found it much more effective to kind of follow the Cho pattern, where you take <coughs> organic matter and and your <coughs> your inoculum, your your IMO2 um, or wherever you're going to get it from, and you blend those first. One that spreads your inoculum, it multiplies it like through the roof. That's the whole reason why you blend the IMO2 with the mill run is to proliferate it, yeah? Um, before you mix it through the roof. So it proliferates that. And two, it makes, it's really easy to turn before you add the dirt. Once you get the dirt, it gets really heavy. And it's not so easy to turn anymore. So, um, so you kind of, you know, you mix your wood chip sawdust, la da 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 um, with, you need to add some, 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 some micro food to that. Yeah, wood chips, they'll cook a little bit on their own, but um, typically you'll want to add a portion of the fish meal with the wood chips. So if I'm going to go, if I'm going to have 2% uh, fish meal in my, in my total mix, I'm going to add about 1% of that to the wood chips and, and, and inoculate that with the IMO2 or, or whatever. Blend that up. And then when I mix that with the dirt, I'm going to add a little bit more fish meal at that point in time. And, and then blend that up. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it, and it, and it kind of has to serve the purpose. So this served this purpose really well. 
and I was just blown away at like um, at that coverage. You don't you don't see that unless you cover it. If you just leave it exposed to the sun, all that all that all that fungal growth is just going to be right underneath the surface, and it won't get that beautiful cotton ball kind of thing going. Um, so I covered it with the tarp. Yeah, covered with the tarp. Um, I find that to uh, a tarp or banana leaves or coconut leaves. Cardboard. Cardboard. Again, I mean, it's all in the Cho book. You know, you don't just leave it open to the sun. You cover it. So it's 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 basically a a somewhat uh, somewhat transformed version of IMO five. You know, instead of using mill run, I'm using wood chips. And, and wood chips don't work alone. You got to give them a little more food. Um, so I use the fish meal as, as the food to get the wood chips to have a more similar characteristics to the mill run. The mill run has protein and carbohydrates. Wood chips have some carbohydrate value, but that carbohydrate value is hard to unlock without some energy uh, provided by the protein. So, um, so I make my own mill run equivalent by mixing wood chips and, uh, and, and fish meal and, and um, just kind of basically follow the recipe from there. Uh, I, I don't make IMO uh, one and two that often because I have constant um, three and I have constant rotations of IMO three. Uh, because I'm, I make and sell biochar, every batch of biochar that I make gets inoculated um, with a with a with a mother batch of IMO three. So I have a constant batch of IMO three that I make once a month, basically, and then I use that to inoculate my biochar. So I can just pick from my IMO three pile or some of the biochar that's been inoculated. All the biochar cells in the stores have been inoculated, so that's another source you can get it if you're not making it your own. You can go down and get the IMO um, 4, right, that you're selling, IMO 4 that he's selling, and then use that as your inoculum, right? He sells a really good product, nice and clean. You can get that product and then spread that product further by mixing it with some wood chips and just kind of expanding it and, and, and going like that, using that as, as kind of the seed. Um, so any questions on the on the on the local style homemade IMO? Are you using ash for the potassium at all? <coughs> where I, I don't know where to get ash. Just burn. Just burn, burn to ash. Yeah, burn but I find it really wasteful. Biomass. I find it really wasteful because I'd rather burn to char than burn to ash. Um, and sure. the, the the biochar. So uh, I mean, a lot of the ingredients I add. <laughs> sure, because I mean, okay, I can take a truckload of wood. Uh, I, you know, I, I I can take a truck and trailer of, of raw lumber. You know, just all the all the all the scrap, this and that, and trimmings from my friend's yard or whatever. I can take a truck and trailer of that, and and get almost a truckload full of biochar. It's pretty darn efficient. You know, the stuff shrinks a little, but it's almost like sending it through a wood chipper. If I burn that all the way to ash. Wow, you know, I mean, I've just lost so much. I get it's like a whole weird. different thing, though, see, because you'd be going for the potassium then primarily. But if you, rather than use the wood, use the frass, the uh, leaves, and whatever other stuff that you're not going to talk. We're, we're building a new kiln right now, and with the new kiln that we're building, we are going to have it's, it's uh, multiple chambers in uh -huh. the kiln, and we're going to have one chamber is the firebox, and for every time we do a run, we're going to have sacrifice sacrificial wood, you know, so, so there's going to be, you know, stuff. some amount of wood that's just going to be completely turned to ash. So I will start having some amount of ash, but you know, most ash is like five to seven percent potassium. Um, most typical wood ash, you know, there's some plants um, that have extremely high levels of potassium, but um, you know, sulfate of potash is, is pretty darn affordable. It's really darn efficient and it <coughs> seems to be okay if you don't use it you know, excessively, um, and it's a zero zero fifty. So I can keep, I can. Uh, it, it really works well with the blend that I'm going with, because I only need to add about ten percent to spike it up to be a completely balanced um, product. Where the 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 char fish that I have, uh, you know, the fish meal alone starts off at about a nine seven one. So if I want to make a blended product, I'd have to I'd have to cut it with so much ash. It'd be more ash than it would be fish. So. Um, so by using the sulfate of potash, I'm able to, to get a balanced NPK with only about 10%. I actually use a slightly less than 10%, about eight or so, um, to get it up to balance. Um, so, so, yeah. But I'm looking for more sources of potassium. Uh, all right, well, let's, any more questions on this slide? How often do you turn the compost? 
I didn't. I never turned it. No. Um, part of the, what I did is uh, I had the wood chips already, you know, already in a stage of IMO three. Um, I came home with a truckload of dirt, and it was not a full full truck. So what I did is I simply uh, I flattened it out a little bit, threw some more biochar on top, threw a little bit more of my charfish on top, threw the wood chips on top. So it was all kind of like a lasagna. And then as I'm unloading it out of the truck, it's getting blended right there. So I never had to turn it. I just took it right out of the truck into the pile, shaped the pile up nice, covered it, and that's what it looked like just a couple days later. Did the inside look like the outside? I brought some from the inside. And, and you know what's really cool is that this was a couple months ago. This was like maybe six weeks ago or something like that. The outside now looks like dirt or it looks like, you know, more like soil. And it went from having kind of a, more of a powdery texture to a very granulated texture. It, it aggregated into, you know, like soil should. It, it, you know, these clay soils, you really want them to aggregate and become like little, like little granules, almost like the size of styrofoam balls. Um, and, it, and so it took on that nice crumb structure. But then, yeah, the outside is just plain dirt color, but you dig, you dig, you know, six to eight inches underneath that, and it's just pure white inside. It's just pure white. So I brought some in and it got a little bit dirtied up with some of the stuff from the outside falling in. But I brought a bucket in that you guys can get your hands dirty. I don't want to get my hands dirty, but um, I don't even touch the computer. But yeah, I brought some in and it's still, even after six weeks, totally white through the inside. Um, it's it's kind of kind of cool. Um, yeah? <coughs> so you used IMO4 as, as an inoculant? Um, more like IMO3. Oh, okay, IMO3. Yeah. Um, and how much percentage of the pile is that? Well, it was about 20%. Okay, 20% is that. It was about 20%. And I mean, these numbers are totally open for, for playing around. I haven't, I have not fine-tuned it because every time I've done it, I've been using slightly different materials. So I have to kind of like look at it and think about it. Hmm, I think this. And you know, like I did a, like, okay, well, here's a good, we'll, we'll segue into the papaya project. So with the papayas, no, actually, let me hold that for a second. I'll just, that'll come real soon. So here's, here's up close. Um, you can see, I mean, it's a complete mycelial mass. You know, completely just change the structure of that soil pretty darn quick. Um, you can just, you know, like a cookie cutter, you can just cut it out and throw it around like frisbees and stuff. It's pretty amazing, that stuff. Um, here's a pile I, I started making just last week. This is for a client down in Opecal. And, um, so it's just the beginnings of it. He had, he had the Pepe Kill, um, the Pepe Kill cane wash soil brought in. Um, again, he's in Opeke Cal, there's no soil, we gotta make our own. So he brought that in, and then, um, and then I showed up at the truck and I spread the fish meal down, and um, you know, already pre-blended with the, with, the, with the blue rock and the passing and such. Uh, spread that down, and then spread just a little bit of um, Biochar that's a basically an IMO, it's like a biochar IMO3. You know, I inoculate all my biochar, so it's, it was, you know, just, just to have some inoculum right on it. And then we came back with, uh, with the truckload full of sawdust. So I covered it with about three and a half yards of, uh, of sawdust. Um, and then he, uh, and then he blended all that up. Um, he blended all that up and it's still cooking right now. So, um, so this was about, I guess the recipe for this was, I went a little bit, I went a little bit skinny on the fish. This was only about like two, one and a half maybe even, um, because a pile I'd done previously, I went, I went a full five percent on the fish, but I didn't have enough, um, I didn't have enough of the uh, raw organic material, and it, it got pretty rank in there. I mean, it worked wonderful. I mean, the, the, the guy can't stop raving about how fast his pumpkins are growing, you know, but um, it was, uh, was kind of stinky. <laughs> yeah. Your blue rock is it powdery or is it granular? Or? Yeah, it's um, it's pretty. It's kind of sand. It's. Ginger sand. Sand. It's just the mortar sand. Yeah, it's mortar it's sand. Grains, but the mortar sand is the, is the finest stuff. you can get, and it's it's sixty bucks a ton, and you can't <laughs> buy it other than just showing up with your truck and buying a ton, um, and they just dump it in the back of your truck and you take it home, um, and it's it's kind of. There is some very fine powder, but there are some large particles too. Um, there are some large particles, and more than a sixteenth, I'd say almost an eighth of an inch, you know, little chunks. So, um, but it is fairly well powdered, and, and it, it seems to work really well at bringing some life to the clay soils. Um, 
So here's the papayas. All right, so the papaya project I'm working on, uh, the soil's pretty good down where I live. It's mostly cinder, though. Um, and so we planted some, uh, some papayas about, um, about an acre and a half, well, almost two acres last spring. And we had a horrible drought this last summer, and we lost most of it. You know, the papayas <coughs> lived, most, almost, almost all of them lived, but, uh, you know, about 70% of them were so pathetic, they weren't worth trying to grow into maturity. So um, we kind of had to scrap a lot of them. And um, part of it was because the soil down there is mostly cinder. Um, you know, it's right near my backyard, and we're right near the cinder pit. It's mostly cinder. didn't have very much water holding capacity. So little bits of rain that we got were just not sticking. And um, so we did use a little bit of IMO4 um, and a little bit of dirt with each plant that we did, but only a little sprinkle, um, you know, about a shovel or two maybe at most. Um, and they didn't do – they the ones that did well did really well, but the drought was just – if it wasn't drought, it probably would. Anyways, so for a little security, I made up a, a, a very large batch um, using that same recipe. Um, very large batch, I think about 40 yards um, was, was the full size of the batch. And, and blended it all up and let it cook off and, you know, cooks off the weeds a little bit, resets the uh, microbial population. And then we planted the papayas in a five gallon bucket worth every hole. Right, so we dug a nice hole, dumped a full five gallon bucket for every hole, and um, this is how the pies are looking now. This was just last week or something, and this is uh, six or no, more like eight weeks out. Um, but you know, they're really just pumping, and this is straight in that soil, no fertilizer or anything yet. Um, just just living off the nutrients that were in that uh, soil mix we made. Um, here's the papayas producing. This is some of the. This is from one of the plants that survived the drought last summer, um, and so the plants that did make it are doing quite well. You know, we got fruit coming on, and uh, they're just, uh, you know, cooking right along. Um, this is all with, you know, 100% local minus a little bit of potassium. And uh, Eric made me up a real nice batch of a Cho blend of. Um, some various stuff, OHN, water soluble calcium, water soluble calcium phosphate, a little bit of lacto, and some other stuff. And we use that every other week. Um, we also use a little bit of the uh, worm juice that he made. Um, and then I make compost tea about once a month or so. So we alternate between all of those um, as our foliar applications. And you such. have no disease? Uh, you know what? The disease thing was, was interesting. We have papaya ring spot virus throughout the field. Um, and during the drought last summer, it was very visible. I mean, total spaghetti leaves. They were just all mutated, you know, not so pretty. Um, but uh, as the rain started coming back and the, you know, the plants were able to start, you know, getting things going, uh, there is now almost zero visible disease out there. Um, of course, we have the leaf, the, the foliar. You can see some of the, the foliar stuff right there. We have that coming in all the time, you know, um, and that's just a matter, like I said, I'm kind of lazy on the spraying. I, you know, we spray once a week, I should almost be up in it, you know, maybe almost twice a week, or, or really start getting more in tune with exactly what kind of sprays are the most effective. I'm really excited to try this oil spray because keeping the leaves from getting uh, attacked by all the different things that like attack is uh, it's kind of important that you don't waste that energy to the extent. Um, this was, uh, this was great news I got last week. Um, this is Roy Honda Farms. Roy Honda lives over in Konaside, and he's been in the growing business for <coughs> three or some, three some odd decades. Um, growing tomatoes and cucumbers and um, all in greenhouses and, and, and in very large quantities. He, um, he came to me a couple months ago interested in biochar. He got some at the store and was very interested to get some more. And uh, he's basically growing in a uh, semi-hydroponic type operation here. He's got fertigation, uh, fertilizer in the irrigation. He also sprinkles a little bit of compli humus on the uh, soil. But he's basically growing in uh, just something to hold the roots. It's coffee parchment. Um, and he was interested in using biochar as part of the potting media um, to, to help better capture the nutrients that the plants are being given and uh, to help with a lot of the root rots that he was getting. He had a lot of problem with root rot. You know, he's pulling these plants up, they were just torn up. 
And so, you know, when the roots are unhappy, the rest of the plants have trouble. So anyways, I gave, uh, I, I sold him uh, about three yards a couple months ago and um, just took these pictures. This was, it just been planted, so he didn't have anything yet. But then, um, talked to him a couple weeks after and he said, oh, you know, no, not really anything yet. And I was like, oh no, wow, really? And then, and then he just called me last week to order more and more because he just said, oh my gosh. You know, the, um, the combination of, I, I think part of it is not just the biochar, but the, the fact that it's inoculated as well, bringing some biology to this, uh, bringing some biology to the action there. So anyways, that was an exciting happening with natural farming type stuff going on in the past couple weeks. Um, here is Eric Weinert's place. He mentioned the, the corn. He showed you that, um, that, that bed that he had with all the biochar sprinkled on it and said, oh, maybe I'll show you some pictures. Here's the pictures from that. Here's corn with nothing, um, just a little bit of mulch covering it. Here's, uh, here's with IMO, um, IMO 4, I'm imagining, uh, tilled into the soil and then covered with grass clippings. And then here's with IMO 4 and biochar tilled into the soil with grass clippings. And then, uh, so this was three weeks out. Here's six weeks, here's with nothing. Here's with uh, IMO 4 um, alone. And then here's with the IMO 4 and biochar together. Um, so that was that was a couple years ago, and this has been pretty typical. Um, one thing we find is that the you know the biochar and the, and, and the microbial activity kind of go hand in hand. It's been a mystery to me sometimes the whole biochar thing. I, I I wish that I could give people like okay, this is exactly the result you can expect. But um, sometimes it's been like wow, I really expected big results and we didn't get much. And sometimes I you know, the opposite, we didn't expect much of it. wow, you know. Um, more and more I see it tied into the biology. And that's why I think the, uh, the natural farming and the, um, and the biochar kind of go hand in hand. It makes sense because natural farming knew about biochar years ago and it's just now that the Western society is kind of catching on. Um, so I, I think this highlights that, um, you know, microbial life is good. So here's uh, Alex Karps, he's in the room over here. Um, this is Island Harvest Organics, same thing, they were using uh, uh, basically a hydroponic type system and there's tomatoes uh, normal and then there's tomatoes with the biochar compost from a project I did last year um, and that's I guess the extent of the slideshow. So um, any questions? Maybe so they'll just kind of like graze past and actually take some bites out of out of char out of charred stuff and you know various stories of oh my animals eat this but I always hear the dog eats my charcoal thing a lot of exciting like oh wow isn't this interesting but there hasn't been enough consistent research for me to feel comfortable telling you this is exactly what but there's been some very interesting research that people have been doing um, with feeding charcoal uh, as part of um, uh, as part of ruminants food, you know, basically goats and uh, sheep and, and cattle, particularly with cattle. Um, cattle have multiple stomachs and their food is digested by microorganisms. Um, charcoal has been shown time and time again to someone act as a catalyst on this with the microorganisms. It helps them proliferate, they're more active, they work faster, more efficient, you know, basically uh, helps them do their job. So the idea is, okay, we'll put a little bit of charcoal in the cattle feed and we'll see what happens. They found better assimilation of the food. Less of the, less of the food was lost through their butt. You know, more of it got, you know, as, as gas, you know, they were farting less, uh, more of it got into their system. They had more efficient digestive. But again, this was like, you know, tip of the iceberg kind of stuff. They're just getting into it. Uh, only a few studies have found it. It's not like proven yet. With chickens, they've shown that time and time again, and it's really catching on with chickens. A number of people have done that, where they they include little bits of charcoal with the chicken feed, and the chicken eats that, and it helps them stay healthier and gain weight and uh, various various things like that. So I imagine that is, but I'm not a goat doctor. Um, Homeopathic um, me medicine for you know, it's, it's gas is charcoal. Yes. Right. 
Um, activated carbon, that's typically activated. medical grade, food grade, activated carbon. <laughs> as much as my product is probably safe, I wouldn't eat I, it. Well, I mean, I, I have just, you know, oh, you know, just whatever, see what it tasted like, but I wouldn't really recommend eating it. No. I, I would go get some medical grade. <laughs> Josiah, are you going to give another um, demonstration on how to make biochar? Do you want me to? Well, I just wondered if one was scheduled. There's none scheduled, but uh, we could schedule one. Um, I, I, I don't mind teaching. I, I, I love to share the knowledge. I find it really fun, and I don't find it to hurt my business that much because most people find out that it's really difficult. Um, and, and so then, they're, then they don't feel so bad about the price that they're charging. Um, and the people that do have all the energy to make it themselves, and uh, that's more power to you, and we really should stop depending upon other people to take, you know, so, yeah. Long story short, I'd, li I'd, I'd gladly do that. So if we're not going to make it, where do we buy it? Garden Exchange, oh, okay. John Rosette's, Is that stuff you made? Pahoa Feed and Fertilizer, yeah. I would buy direct from you. You can buy direct from me, but as out of respect with the retail, um, that uh, I, I can only sell in bulk quantities. So if you want to buy direct from me, it's got to be a minimum of one yard, which is 350 so a minimum, you know, then, then you get the bulk price, which is about half the price of retail. Because I got to bag it up. Long story short, you pay twice. So anyways, you can buy it direct from me. I, I let, much prefer to do that. I can deliver it straight to your house. You can come pick it up from mine. Um, what, what's the price? 350 for one yard. And that the one yard is the minimum for the bulk rate. Um, yeah, I'll deliver it, not for free. I mean, occasionally I can give you a free delivery if you happen to live off the side of the road and you're willing to wait until I'm passing your way or something. But typically, you know, and you offer me lunch and beer and stuff like that. I don't know. But anyways, no, I don't charge a heck of a lot for delivery. Typically 20 bucks in Puna, you know, 40 bucks in Greater Hilo, and, you know, it turns into a lot more on the other side of the island. Um, and I can deliver with my new truck now as much as, uh, gosh, five yards with my truck and trailer. Um, and then, so I've been working on, with that papaya project, um, it has been such a wonderful learning experience. I've been 